Welcome to Raven Talk, the official podcast of the Raven Tribe. The Raven Tribe is a home for warriors on the path and is dedicated to training warriors for the battlefield of life. Visit us on the web at theraventribe.com where you can learn more information on membership, warrior training, as well as links to our official YouTube channel, Facebook group, apparel store, and our official bookstore, Marshall Books. Welcome back, Tribe. Today we're here with special guest, senior Tribe member Chad McBroom, and we're going to be discussing his book, Solving the Enigma, an excellent foray into understanding martial arts and understanding the functionality of martial arts. Chad, how are you doing today? I'm doing good. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. I'm excited to have you on, Chad. This book is uh, something very near and dear to my heart. I I see you as the father of this book, and I like to consider myself the uncle of this book because we talked so much during its development and, uh, you know, prior to its publication. But, Chad, for the audience at home, uh, we've had you on the show before, but in case people missed your previous episode, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and what inspired you to write this book? Yeah, so, um, you know, I've been studying uh, martial arts since I was 11 years old. Um, you know, train a lot of different systems. Uh, you know, started off in Taekwondo like a lot of people. Um, you know, when I'm training in, in the uh, Japanese arts, karate and Aikido, um, got into the uh, Filipino arts, um, Kali, Silat, uh, Thai boxing, all of those things kind of within the, the uh, Danny Nosanto group there and uh, um, just just kind of ran the gamut uh, of martial arts training and so uh, I guess my inspiration to write the book was just kind of trying to make sense of what it is that I do as a martial arts and, uh, and kind of convey that to other people so that they could understand what I did. So, Chad, tell me, let's just delve right in here to the book. The book is a short book, but it's full of great information. Um, You know, I'm probably going to make a lot of people angry with with the statement, but uh, people will always put Bruce Lee's Tao of Jeet Kune Do out there as this phenomenal work in the martial arts, and I am not a big fan of that book. And I made the statement once that this is the book that should have been the Tao. You know, I find this book more important. I find it more insightful, and I think it gives people real concrete answers to what they need. Now, when you develop the book, I know because you and I, you know, touch base so much during its development that you were looking at what made martial arts functional, and being able to identify that would help people to, you know, fill gaps in their training, to correct their training, and I think people need to listen to you. I mean, you're a professional trainer. Um, you know, this is what you do for a living. It was train people, and you've trained people at very high levels. Uh, without getting too deep into your background, um, you know, I think it's safe to say that you've, you know, done this on a professional level more than most people in our field. So, let's get started. What were some of the things that you identified? I know you kind of categorized the things that you wanted to cover in this book and, and address the issues that you saw that needed to be looked at. So. How did you start to formulate, you know, the main ideas that people needed to learn from this book? Well, it's kind of it's kind of interesting because um, I would like to say that uh, you know that I had all this information and and I sat down and formulated this plan to write this book, um, but, but the truth is it kind of happened by accident. Um, and I know, and, and you may even realize this because, like you said, you, you've been around since the early stages of the book when I was first uh, you know, contemplating the book and, and, you know, beginning to put it together. Um, you may have observed some of the transformation that took place. But really, when I, when I started writing the book, it, I had no intention of going the direction that I ended up going with it. Um, and like I said, it kind of happened accidentally. So when I started writing the book, initially it was going to be more of, of, of an instructional type book. And I wanted to, um, 
I wanted to teach people how to, you know, how to kind of maximize uh, what they do mechanically and and um, you know, strategy-wise and, and different things like that, and kind of kind of explain uh, how I look at things. And that and as I started writing the book, um, you know, I had ideas of things that I wanted to talk about. I wanted to talk about biomechanics. I wanted to talk about the uh, the historical uh, relevance of, of the martial arts and different fighting systems and and what made those things work and um, and as I began writing the book it 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 took on this different life form and um, one day I was actually listening to a podcast from it totally unrelated to the martial arts. We were listening to a podcast from a guy um, who was talking about I can't remember something like about maximizing your web traffic or something like that. And he started talking about um I had another guy on the show and they were talking about um how they had built a model for uh teaching whatever it was that they had done. And all of a sudden, as I was listening to this podcast, I had this epiphany that that was what I had done accidentally with this book. And so it was at that point that I, that I kind of went back and, and sort of restructured the book and came up with the, the chapters as they are now and which, the chapters themselves um, really became a uh, steps within a process of really building a martial arts system, and that was really kind of what it came down to. Was uh, if I had to summarize what the book is really about, it's about uh, how to build a martial arts system, whether you're whether you're doing it from scratch, you know, and you said like. Hey, I've never even trained in martial arts and I want to build my own martial arts system, my own fighting system that's going to, uh, work, be the absolute best system for me in my environment. Or if you're somebody that's been training martial arts your whole life and you're, you've only trained in one system and you're really, uh, dedicated to that system, um, it, it will teach you how to maximize what you're doing um, and how to make your martial arts training uh, work for you. So, Chad, we kind of have an understanding of what your goals were. And I'd like for you to kind of outline for us, and you break it down by chapter, but outline for us what are some of the things that are needed to make sure that a martial art functions correctly. Okay, so um, so first, you have to start with really understanding your art or the art that you're training in. What is it that what is it that makes that art functional, and and um, what things went into the formulation of that art? And so, a lot of people. You know, if they think of martial arts, and, and for lack of better a better term, I'm going to say traditional martial arts because there's you know there's kind of the there's that idea today that you know if it's if you put on a gi and a belt, um, then you're doing you know traditional martial arts. Um, but if you're doing something else, then it's not traditional. Uh, I don't re- necessarily think that that is a is a perfect. Uh, paradigm for for examining martial arts but but because that's what so many people understand i'm gonna i'm just gonna use that term traditional uh traditional martial arts um and so when we look at traditional martial arts i think there's a tendency uh, we look at um when we look at the historical relevance or just the relevance in general the functional relevance of the art a lot of times we'll look at the history behind it 
you know, what was the art used for at the time? You know, for example, uh, uh, traditional jiu-jitsu uh, as opposed to, you know, Brazilian jiu-jitsu. Um, we look at traditional jiu-jitsu as basically the empty hand uh, art of the samurai. And so we look at that and we're like, yeah, it was the empty hand fighting art of the samurai. And uh, and so we, you know, we might look at some of the uh, applications of it, how they would have used it in their environment, but we kind of stopped there. And um, <clears throat> and we don't really delve into it. And and so what happens is with a lot of different with a lot of different systems, we look at it through our our lens, right? Our modern day lens uh, within our environment, and we look at it. And we make a determination, like, oh, that's that would never work because of A, B, C, and D. And um, what we fail to do is is look at well why what was the cultural context not just <clears throat> where did the art come from but we have to look at all the things around it like what was the culture what was the um, what was the armor that was used or the clothing that was worn in that culture, because that affects that affects an art, right? So if if the, if the environment in which the art was um, was developed, if everybody wore uh, as part of their armor, if they wore um, chainmail then a slashing type blade system wouldn't be very effective against that armor. So they would have to change it up to make it more of a thrusting type system in order to defeat the armor. Or their targets would change. Or um, And so you'll see all of those developments based on the armor that they're dealing with. And when I say armor, I'm using that broad, broadly because, again, armor could apply to, to the clothing that's being worn. Um, you know, if you live in a cold environment where people are, you know, where you're wearing three or four layers of clothing, it's going to have a very similar effect on uh, on the use of edge weapons as if you were wearing something that was cut resistant like like chainmail. So, you know, all of those things, the culture, the laws um, that govern the weapons, um, you know, there's just there's just a lot of different things that that can affect um, what goes into the development or what went into the development of these arts. And it even happens today. But it's something that we that we uh, frequently fail to recognize when we're examining the arts. I think that's a great point, Chad. I mean, you know, kind of bringing it to something very common that we see now, anybody that trains in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, you know, we rarely see small joint manipulation. And I remember being back in college when – Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu first kind of hit the scene, and I was in a class, and I'm taking a class, and I, I saw a guy next to me put a wrist lock on somebody, tap him out, he won the, the match, and everybody looked pissed. Everybody looked upset, and I, I couldn't figure it out. Mikey did a good job. He won won the match. And later it was explained to me that small joint manipulations like that were kind of frowned upon and kind of seen as like a, a cheap win or a cheap way of winning. So – just even understanding something as simple as the culture, you know, of, in which these things develop will reflect, you know, the application and what techniques are trained and worked on. Um, so I think that you're you're hitting the nail on the head. You really have to understand, you know, the people themselves who are doing these things to really understand if they work. Sure, something that was, you know, done uh, in Korea years ago, you know, a couple hundred years ago may not be as relevant to somebody living in, you know, Boston in 2016. Right, and you know, and that was one of the 
<clears throat> now that you mentioned that, there was another factor that I, that I discuss in the in what I call the organization. One of the early chapters of the book is organization. How how the art is organized. And let me back up just a, 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 a second. The subtitle to my book, the title of the book is Solving the Enigma. The subtitle is Insight into Fighting Models. And uh, I had somebody, it's funny, I had somebody one time, they're like, uh, they saw that and they're like, are you talking about runway models or or uh, swimsuit models? <laughs> um, nice. Both, both, of course. Right, right. Uh, so I guess, you know, I guess context, you know, how you, <laughs> how you, per- how you perceive things. Um, but, <clears throat> but what I did in the book is, in kind of my outlook on the martial arts, is I look at every art as a model of fighting. Okay. So, you know, it's a, it's a paradigm. It's, <clears throat> That's really all it is because um, everywhere you go on the planet, people have two arms and two legs, and those those are joints. They all move in the same directions everywhere you go on the planet. And so there's only so much, so many ways the body can move. And um, so there's really, really nothing new. There's nothing new under the sun, you know. So people have. <clears throat> so when it comes to fighting, the 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 general principles are the same everywhere you go. You're trying to do damage to another individual, right, while preventing them from doing damage to you. And <clears throat> and so really, every art is just a model of fighting that's been that's been organized um, based on those things that I mentioned, the the culture, uh the the wet technology, the armor technology, um, the laws, the area, terrain, uh climate, you know, climate you know affects the clothing that we wear. Um you know, and then and then down to even motivation. What was the purpose of the art? And and so, kind of going back to what you were <clears throat> what you were discussing with the uh, the those small joint manipulations. Um, every fighting model, whether it is a sport based model, a self defense based model. Um, a dueling type model, which is really the same as a sport. Uh, there's a motivation for it. There's a motivation behind the art. There's a reason that we are fighting. So the reason may be I'm fighting to protect my life and the life of my loved ones. Or the motivation may be I'm fighting for my country, um, you know, to defend my country from against this invading tribe or this invading uh country. Um or the motivation may be I'm fighting for, for my honor or for for a trophy. So um you know when we we get in the ring in a jujitsu tournament the motivation there is to submit the opponent and um, and there's been a certain set of rules, which is really a set of laws that govern it. There's a uh, there's a certain certain culture around it, and uh, that motivation affects how how they fight. So all of that. All of those things are things that we have to to put into context when we're uh, when we're looking at, at different arts. So, Chad, after looking at some of the social and cultural, uh, you know, backdrop that helps to develop how a system grows, what other things are what other things are, are 
there that we should be aware of when, when analyzing whether or not a fighting model is functional? So, okay, so really the origin of the of the art, as I talked about, and then we look at, um, really the next thing we would look at would be, would be categoriz- categorization, right? And kind of touching on what I was uh, getting there. So many of these, these concepts really tie in together um, throughout the book, but um, you know, categorization, you really break the, the, uh, you know, fighting models down into three categories. Um, uh, those would be dueling, self-defense, and combat. And I know, um, and again, these are categories for the purpose of this, of the book and the purpose of, of, you know, really wrapping your brain around, uh, around these ideas. Because I know we use a lot of these terms interchangeably. We, you know, combatives, we talk about you know, combatives and, and, you know, things like that. So, so don't misunderstand where, where I'm going with these. Um, but, but when I, breaking them down into dueling self-defense or combat, every fighting art falls into one of those categories <clears throat> as I define them in my book. And so, so a dueling art would be um, anything that's that's sport oriented uh, or has a some type of mutual agreement between combatants. And uh, see, I'm even using the word combatants in a dueling sense. Um, but you know, between the participants, um would be considered a duel. So, you know, uh, um, the UFC, an MMA competition, a, a karate tournament, um, you know, even, even a, um, you know, even a Wild West gunfight, you know, it, it, it's a duel because there's, there's certain understanding, a certain agreement between people. There's certain rules that, that govern, that govern it, whether they're, official rules or whether they're just understood within uh within the within the culture of the group those would fall in the under the category of dueling um self defense would be um, those arts that are that are based on self protection you know protecting uh basically reactive so to speak. Um, and again, this isn't necessarily a category of the art, but it's, it's more of the, um, well, it, it is a category of the art, but sometimes these arts fall into multiple categories. So there's, there's, there's a lot of overlap within the categories, but, uh, but self-defense, it's, it's more reactive um, in the sense that somebody is attacking me and uh, my goal for the art is, or my training is to is to fight off that attack or prevent myself from being attacked. Um, so those would that would be the self defense category, and then combat would be uh, a little more of a, a hunter type mindset. Is you know we think of uh, combative arts more of a battlefield type, um, the use of of the arts in, in, in the sense that I'm going after you and, um, you know, to, to beat you. Um, and, and we can even, and I'm using everything I can to my advantage, you know, surprise terrain, all those things that would, that would fall more into the, into combat. So really, if you think about it, self-defense and combat are, are actually the opposite of each other. So, in self-defense, you're almost, um, it's as though you're dealing with somebody who's more combative in the sense that they're attacking you, they're trying to use everything they can to their advantage against you, and uh, which is what we do on the combative side is we're trying to, we're using everything we can to our advantage against you uh, in order to win. And, you know, you can think of even law enforcement, uh, you know, SWAT team, 
going into a house, you know, to throw in the flashbang, uh, you know, distraction device, things like that, using an element of surprise, coming early in the morning, you know, all the things that they can to gain a tactical advantage over you. Um, that kind of goes into the uh, into the combat realm of fighting. And then, um, and then the next thing would be just you know, the, the biomechanization of the art and looking at you know structural alignments and balance and um, you know power generation. What makes the the movements of the art work? And that's really you know the framework of the art itself. And um, you know, and so there's there's some different uh, there's some other things that I talk about in the book that really kind of get into you know evolving the art and adapting and and uh, some training recommendations for optimizing the the art. Um, but in a nutshell, that's that's kind of what we're looking at in the book. Now, Chad, this book from the way I look at it is kind of almost like a diagnostic manual. You know, I'm sick. I'm going to go look at my, uh, my book, figure out what, you know, what my symptoms are, you know, and then what the treatment's going to be. Is that how you saw the book once you finished putting it to, you know, putting pen to paper? Yeah, it, it really is. Um, my goal with this is with the book was really, um, not just show people what to do, but teach people how to think. And and that's really the ultimate goal of the book, uh, is to teach people how to think. Because, um, you know, as, as my friend Addie Hernandez said one time, thinking is a skill. And it seems to be a skill that we've pretty much lost in society today. Um, and just in general, um, but <clears throat> my goal of the book was to teach people how to look at their their fighting art um, critically and objectively, and um, you know really analyze if what they do and how they train does it make sense. And and is it functional? Um, you know, like you and I talked about uh, before. Uh, not to make anybody mad, but you know, Bruce Lee said, "Absorb what is useful." But if you don't know how to identify what is useful, then then that information doesn't do you any good. Um, and I would even go a little bit further, you know, with that statement. That's one of my uh, – one of the statements I dislike most about that, uh, you know, that book is absorb what is useful. Uh, you know, you get new martial arts students, they don't know what the hell useful is. You know, what what is the litmus test? How do you identify what is useful? And I think that your book gives some guidelines. And, again, your book is not written as a how-to in the sense that, you know, these are the best techniques – it's written in a way to help people identify what is useful in their art, how to find the, the functionality to what they do. And I feel like where he posed a question, you, you know, gave an answer. So let me ask you this, just to give the audience at home a, a, an example. Let's pull out one of the tools that you use in identifying. And if you want, I'd like to talk about two of them that I remember stick out very clearly in my mind having conversations with you about. Um, things like time contexting. You know, how this right. is, is something that if you don't understand time contexting, your art will never function for you, regardless of what art it is. Tell us, the audience, you know, what time contexting is and how to properly make use of it. Yeah, so so time contexting is was a term that I came up with when I was writing the book um, to try to explain a, a specific concept. Uh, it was really the only way, the only term I could think of uh, that really that really explained what I was what I was trying to to get across. And 
So basically, time context is a term that I use to describe the process of placing train fighting responses into the proper context of time. Um, <clears throat> so, um, and, and with that, we have to remember that, that action beats reaction. And <clears throat> so, so when we're training, we want to train with a top proper time context. And, and we want to factor in those things, uh, like, like the fact that action beats reaction when we're trained. And so, so here's, so here's the best way to explain what time contexting is. So you go on YouTube and you can watch 8 million examples of what time contexting is not. So, um, you know, you have a guy, um, you know, we train a technique and we have a guy throw a punch. And you'll see this in Kali, you'll see it in Kempo, you'll see it in, in karate. I mean, I, there really are no arts that you won't see it in. Actually, probably boxing is the one art you won't see this in because of the way they train. They understand that and they don't even know that they understand that, but they understand time context. Um, so, what happens most most of the time in training, people say, okay, we're going to practice this technique or this flow drill, whatever, whatever it is. And, you know, and this is a technique, a counter against the punch. And so their, their partner squares off with them, and then they throw a punch in slow motion, or even if it's not in slow motion, they throw the punch, and they get to the end of the punch, and they hold their arm out. And allow the the partner to to do their counter. Right? Yeah, Kempo is notorious for this. Um, you know, a guy will stand there with his arm extended, and while the Kempo practitioner does, you know, fifty three movements um, while the guy is standing there in place. Yeah, my um, my favorite example of that, Chad. I don't know if you've ever seen this article. It was from a magazine back in the like late eighties, or you know. There's a guy that comes out with a knife in a dark alley and the photo progression. He's holding the knife, of course, in the ice pick grip and the, the defender is there. And then the next frame, all of a sudden the defender's shoes are on his hands and <laughs> they're, they, they were advocating, which is a, a whole nother topic, but <laughs> not to get too far off track. They were advocating that you put your, your shoes on your hands to fight off the attacker, um, which, you know, may or may not be valid. Again, that's a debate for another day. But how long does it take you to take your shoes off and put them on your hands when a guy's taking a swing at you? I mean, that's like my, my favorite example of what context, time contexting is not. That's awesome. Um, I wish you could get that fast. <laughs> um, yeah, it, I mean, and it, you know, the, since you since you brought it up that way, uh, it's really a good way of, of looking at time contexting in the sense that we tend to train as though just like that that uh those picture frames that you talked about only we're like our attacker is caught in the frame and we're they're in a still frame and we're in a motion picture so you know he comes and he throws his punch and then and there's this like freeze frame while we continue moving and and we do our technique and, and it's beautiful, you know. And you know, and we're able to cut and block and cut and pass and and do all these cool things. Um and then somebody who's not so cooperative, uh who doesn't train with us, who doesn't train in our art with us, and doesn't have that uh, agreement of movement um that you you like to talk about uh, they step in they're like okay all right try that against me and then they throw a punch, a punch full speed and we're like oh okay hold on i wasn't ready let's do that again you know and we're like oh crap i've been training this movement it doesn't work and 
um, because we've been training in an unrealistic time context. Um, <clears throat> so what I do with my students is when we're training movements, we'll go slow in order to learn the movement, but both people have to operate within the same context of time. In other words, you know, my my feeder, my attacker, he doesn't go, okay, I'm going to throw a right cross and then throw the right cross and extends it out while the other guy, um, you know, parries the cross, does an arm destruction, grabs the arm, does whatever. What are what we have to do is what I make the guys do is okay. We're going to do this slow so that you can learn the movement. So the feeder he throws his punch in slow motion, but he goes through the entire punch. So he throws his arm out, reaches the end of his punch, and he brings his arm back. Now he's doing that in slow motion, but he's going through the full through the full punch. So there's a couple of benefits that you that you get from that even outside of what we're talking about is every time my feeder throws a punch, that's a training repetition. Now those can either be good repetitions or bad repetition. And so if he's, you know, if he's throwing his arm out and leaving it out there, like he never would in a real fight, those are negative repetitions. And how many times does he do that in a class? If he's doing it that way, how many negative repetitions is he getting? And so by staying mentally engaged in his role and he throws throws his attacks um, using the full range of motion and going through and getting his body rotation and all of those things, the mechanics, it's giving him a chance to break down his technique, his attack, his punch. That's giving him a chance to break it down in slow motion and get all of those, uh, train all those minute details that, um, you know, that sometimes we forget about when we're going full speed. Um, <clears throat> so it's an excellent training opportunity for the feeder to train his techniques as he's, as he's, as he's feeding. Okay. So, uh, so that's one aspect of that there. But then, then what it does is it allows the, the defender to see how his techniques work within the proper context of time. So he's not allowed to go, okay, my partner's throwing a punch in slow motion. He's not allowed to go full speed and do his attack because again, He's not operating in the proper context of time, and so essentially he's lying to himself. So, so it takes actually it takes some discipline for 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 people to do this, but they have to go. Okay, I need to go slow so I can learn this movement. So his, his my attacker is coming at me slowly, so I'm going to move in the same relative speed that he's moving in. So he's moving in slow motion as well. That way. As we begin to speed up the, the practice and the training, we start to go to um, to realistic, uh, uh, real time times. <clears throat> all of a sudden, we're not caught going. Oh, wait a minute! None of that worked. All of a sudden, because he because it's full speed now. And I was supposed to, I was supposed to do 18 movements while his arm was still extended. Right? So then, so then that also forces you to, I, I find myself all the time, you can ask my students. I come up, you know, I'll have something in my head like, okay, I got this great, this great technique we're gonna, we're gonna do. Okay, we're gonna train today. And, um, we'll start training the technique, but then as we start to speed things up, I'm like, wait a minute, no. You know what? Delete, <laughs> delete this, this technique that I just taught you because it doesn't fit. It doesn't fit in the proper 
context of time um, that we're training in. In other words, you know, if I'm teaching a jab counter and when we start to speed it up and we're going real time, there's no way that 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 movement can be done, executed against a real time jab, then then it's pointless to train it for that, right? So then we just go, we back up and we go, you know what, guys? Sorry, this isn't the right application here. Let's let's start over. Um, so, but Chad, what are we to do? I mean, we we want to feel really cool when we do our our martial arts techniques. I mean, this time contexting thing is kind of hampering my style here. Yeah, well, I mean, in the martial arts, the trend in the martial arts today is uh, it's more important to um, to give off the perception of skill than than to actually possess skill, right? Because we can do, you know, we can do flow drills, we can do all these uh, nice cooperative um, techniques, and they look really cool on video. And it makes people look like we're really skilled, that we're really skilled fighters. And that may or may not be the case. You know, I'm, I'm not taking anything away from anybody. There are some people that, that, you know, that do those things that are, that are still very skilled. But, um, you know, how, how much, how much are we going to lie to ourselves? How much are we going to lie to our students? how much false security are we going to give our students in, in what we train? Now, Chad, yeah. we, we talked about that kind of agreement of movement and cooperation, and those are things that are real important, I think, in understanding when something is functional. Let's look a little bit at how those things can deceive us, because the way I understand it is – and to kind of clarify for the audience at home that that agreement of movement is, you know, let's say Chad and I have both studied, uh, you know, Kali knife fighting, and we've trained at nauseum, you know, the logical responses to, you know, the common attacks, and we get really good at them, really fluid, we feel comfortable and confident. And here comes a guy that doesn't know what Kali is, he doesn't know what knife fighting is, he's just aggressive, mean, you know wacky, picks up a knife, starts swinging in some unorthodox way, and all of a sudden we find ourselves at a loss because we almost want to stop and say, wait, wait, don't attack that way. Attack this way. Because in training, we've had that agreement with our partners. Now, I understand for the sake of you know structure and flow of class, you have to kind of agree to do things the right way. But I think that people will often neglect just training you know, against somebody that's just kind of going randomly ape shit on you. Um, it doesn't have to be somebody bigger, stronger, or aggressive. I, I give the example that uh, that my son, my son was about nine years old, with eight years old at the time. And I've done some knife training with some really good people. I like to consider myself pretty competent. And, you know, he wanted to spar. He was hanging around class and he's like, Daddy, come on, let's, let's spar. And I sparred a couple rounds with my son. And, he tagged me more than people with, you know, multiple black belts and instructor credentials and knife fighting. I mean, I looked at it and I was like, you know, what's going on here? Why is this kid tagging me more than all these other really good guys? You know, it doesn't make any sense whatsoever until I looked at it. I have trained for, you know, I've trained logical responses to logical attacks. And guess what? Mm -hmm. You know, an eight-year-old on a shitload of candy is, does not act logical. <laughs> They they bounce around, they go left when they should go right, you know, they're they're unorthodox and squirrely and, and just bouncing ball of energy. And I had not trained for that. You know, I had trained to duel with other good duelists and that's what I could do. But when I got presented with this little ball of energy, it threw it all out the window. I think that's where a lot of people look at martial arts and go, Oh, that crap wouldn't work or that crap wouldn't work if, you know, I was going crazy on you. You know, you all you all hear people say, you know, um, Oh, well, when I get ready to fight, I just go crazy. I go crazy. And, you know, we dismiss that. But there's something to it in the sense that <laughs> we need to be a little bit aware that unorthodox attacks, things that are not logical to us based on our training, are very, very dangerous, especially if the only answers we have are to logical attacks. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, how many of us, you know, if we're honest, 
how many of us, um, you know, that have trained, that have trained a long time in the martial arts, you know, go into class, you know, as a, as a black belt and, you know, you're, you're, you go in, you're confident, you're skilled, um, you know, you spar with other people and you, you find that you're very, uh, you're very skilled in sparring. And then all of a sudden you, you pair up with this white belt who's, you know, been in class like three times. So he doesn't know anything. And, and then you get paired up to spar with this guy and all of a sudden you're like, what? What just happened? You know, because just like you, the example you gave with your son, um, the guy is moving unorthodox. He's 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 not moving like a trained person, and all of your time has been spent um, training that way. Um, you know, and so yeah, you kind of find yourself at a loss. Like I, I can't remember. I think it was you that said one time that. that Two people that you fear the most are um, in class with a black belt and a white belt. Yeah, that was something I heard many, many years ago. Yes. Yeah, I think I heard that from you, um, and, and and it's so true, right? The black belt is is very skilled in what he does, and the white belt is very unorthodox. You know, and and you know, to, I'm going to say this at the risk of him like you know, figuring out where I live and coming to my house and, you know, beating me up. But you look at, like, Chuck Liddell. You know, look at how successful that guy was in in the octagon. And if you watch Chuck Liddell, he is, like, he is the most, most unorthodox uh, MMA fighter that I know of. And... Um, I mean, really, you watch his technique, and it's horrible. Um, but it's just, it's so unorthodox that people people didn't know how to deal with it. You know, his punches came at angles that just didn't make sense to to other fighters, and, and they would end up getting knocked out. Um, so... <clears throat> Um, yeah, I mean, there, there's just there's so much there's so much truth behind behind that agreement of movement, and so yeah, we've got to we have to in our training we have to learn to identify identify our shortcomings uh, so that we don't train to a point to where we can only only fight against somebody who's trained in the same art in the same dojo in the same school you know um with the same motivation that we do um because that's not going to translate very well uh into the real world well chad i don't want to give away too much of the book it's it's a smaller book it's a, a quick read, but an important read. And I want to encourage everybody to, you know, go out there and get a copy of this thing. You can find it on Chad's website. Uh, you can also find it on MarshallBooks.com, which is the official bookstore of the tribe. So if you want to support Chad and support the tribe, you know, go ahead and check out MarshallBooks.com. And uh, Chad, please, before we wrap up, tell the audience where they can find you on the web. Uh, yeah, they can go to my website, uh, Comprehensive Fighting Systems. Um, it's probably easy just to Google comprehensive fighting systems. Uh, first thing that pops up will most likely be my website. And, uh, um, you see all, uh, there's a lot of information on the website as far as uh, my background and what I teach and, and what we do. And, and I guess kind of my outlook on the, on the, the martial arts and, uh, combat world and, uh, as well as, uh, you know, upcoming seminars and, and things like that. Great. Well, Chad, thank you again for being on the show. Love having you on and we should get you on real soon in the future. To talk about some other topics. Everybody, please make sure you check out solving the enigma. It will definitely change the way you look at martial arts and it will help you 
to better any art that you're training out there. Again, this is not a book on what are the best techniques, but it's a way of maximizing what you're doing and fixing some common errors that all of us have made in our training. Chad, again, thank you for your insight. And uh, again, to the audience, I hope you check out the book, Solving the Enigma. It's a must-have for any martial arts library, and I don't say that lightly. Thank you, guys. Thank you.